and welcome to the first Walls Lecture of 2023. My name is Tom Bula. I am a tender track investigator in the neuro rehabilitation and biomechanics section of the Clinical Center's Rehabilitation Medicine Department. I am thrilled and honored to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Rory Cooper, who has pioneered innovative design for wheelchairs and other assistive robotics and devices. Dr. Cooper is, and this will take me a few minutes to say, the FISA Paralyzed Veterans of America Distinguished Professor and Past Chair in Department of Rehabilitation Science and Technology and Professor of Bioengineering, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research for STEM and Healthcare Sciences Collaboration at Pittsburgh. He holds an adjunct faculty position at the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon and is an invited professor at Qian Jiong Tang University in China. Additionally, and perhaps most pertinent to today, he is the founder and director of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories at Pitt, where he and his team create remarkable tools to help people with disabilities maximize their potential. As you can see, Dr. Cooper uses a wheelchair to move about. While serving in the US Army in Germany in 1980, an accident left him with a paralyzing spinal cord injury. Although he was only 20 years old at the time, this accident clearly has shaped Dr. Cooper's life in ways that I consider positive uh, by virtue of his then putting this experience and his intelligence and creativity to work in helping improve the lives of others. After his military service, Dr. Kirk Cooper earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from California Polytechnic State University where he then re and he then received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering with a concentration in bioengineering from the University of California at Santa Barbara. He then went on to be an assistant professor of bioengineering at Sacramento State University before moving to Pitt as an associate professor where he founded the Human Engineering Research Lab and also includes and runs a VA center for wheelchairs and assistive robotics engineering. Dr. Cooper has authored or co-authored almost 400 peer-reviewed journal articles, two books, and he is co-author of the award-winning book, Care of the Combat Amputee. He also has more than 20 patents awarded or pending. Just for a brief snapshot of Dr. Cooper's work, do a YouTube search of Cooper and New Chair. That's P-N-E-U, New, which is short for pneumatics. It's a wheelchair powered completely by compressed air, which broadens the potential environments for wheelchair use, including, for example, allowing children to operate this wheelchair at a water park without fear of being electrocuted. Dr. Cooper has done similar rehab work with injured veterans through collaborations with our colleagues across the street at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, and many of whom I'm told are watching today. Dr. Cooper is also an accomplished athlete and participant in the National Veterans Wheelchair Games, winning more than 200 medals in sports such as slalom, track, swimming, table tennis, and hand cycle. As we noted in our listserv advertisement for this lecture, we're pretty sure Dr. Cooper is the only wall speaker to be featured on a box of Cheerios for his accomplishments. We're still checking with Dr. Fauci's office. You never know, but we're pretty confident. Other honors include the 2021 Sigma Chi John P. McGovern Award, which recognizes achievements by a scientist or engineer that transcend their career, a Samuel E. Heyman Service to American Service Medal, the U.S. Army Distinguished Civilian Service Medal, and a Secretary of Defense Meritus Civilian Service Medal. And just last week, Dr. Cooper was named to the National Inventors Hall of Fame Class of 2023. I could continue, but now I want to share the pleasure with you, as my colleagues have had throughout the day, of hearing from our speaker. The title of his talk is Forging a New Future, Inclusion of People with Disabilities in Technology Research and Development. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Rory Cooper. Thank you, Thomas, for that great introduction. Thanks you for letting me be back at NIH. and. Um, and let me speak on behalf of my colleagues and the, the millions of people with disabilities across America. And, the, and uh, hopefully the, tell you, share a little bit some of the contributions we made and have a little opportunity to talk about some of the contributions that we hope to make and maybe some of the things that we can do together. 
This is our uh, brochure from when we were turned 25. Uh, Hurl is going to turn 30 next year. I can hardly believe it. I, I um, came out to Pittsburgh as a, uh, in a actually in a non-tenure stream position. Said I'd come out for three years, and uh, 29 years later, I'm still there. So it's been a wonderful career, both uh, with the VA and the University of, of Pittsburgh, uh, as well as collaborating with collaborators here um, in Bethesda. So let me just show you a quick video. One in seven people that has a disability of some kind that impairs their activities of daily living. And technology has tremendous potential for improving the lives of people with disabilities. I was serving in the Army as a sergeant in Europe when I was injured, and I came home with a spinal cord injury and had to use a wheelchair. And there was like an 80-pound behemoth that uh, I could hardly get in the car. I realized that there were a tremendous need for improving technology, improving the environment, and, and improving perceptions of people with disabilities. When the opportunity arose to uh, work with the University of Pittsburgh and the VA Pittsburgh healthcare system, it was natural that we'd start HURL. The laboratory our mission is to improve the quality of life for people with disabilities through uh, advanced research or engineering, get people more integrated into the community and to make them more independent. We do this through some of our programs that we have here, whether it's educational or research or outreach. Some of the things you probably didn't know about me, I just wanted to share. Um, this, uh, this picture here, from a personal perspective, that's my first marathon that I did. That's from my hometown newspaper. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, really important about this picture, this, is, this was my peer mentor. I think something we uh, used to use more in rehab and study more. Uh, Tim Davis, he was a Marine injured in the Tet Offensive. Uh, and um, the other thing that's really cool is Tim and I are still friends. And uh, the, the VA was pretty clever in matching me with Tim. He was married, he had uh, kids, he worked. Uh, and that kind of gave me a role model to, uh, to learn a little bit from as well. Uh, I like the title of the article. That was our first marathon, uh, both for Tim and I. Uh, this is about the halfway point. I do want to point out I did beat him. I won my first marathon. Um, Tim was although more of a basketball player. Uh, unfortunately, in 2019, I, um, I got to experience rehab all over again. Not something I would recommend. I had a pretty severe accident in the Marine Corps Marathon here in Washington, D.C. and um, wound up in a, in a coma for about four days. I uh, got great care by some of your friends across the street uh, and um, then went back to Pittsburgh and then back to the VA. And uh, after going through rehab and learning that process, went to acute rehab, outpatient rehab, back, unfortunately, back fully in the fight. But uh, um, it was also surprising to how much changed and how much had not changed in that, in that time period. And then just a little bit more about me that you might not know is, this is an article in Engineering Times, and uh, it came out in the 1990s after I had done this uh, race in Seattle. And I went to a Burger King afterwards, and um, if you saw the video, unfortunately it had to stop early, but you saw some of the early racing chairs, the wheels were up on your armpits, and I was a little bloody and a little dirty and a little road dirt, and this gentleman, um, the, for, this reporter was there, and I, he offered, he thought I was a homeless veteran. And we got to talking in line. I said, I'm a professor and I have a PhD and um, do research. And um, he wrote this article that said that, you know, first impressions are not correct. Uh, I wound up buying him lunch and we had a uh, buying him breakfast. We had breakfast together. But what's interesting about the story is I didn't know he was a porter, never told me. This article came out. 20 years later, I'm doing the, uh, the um, uh, Air Force Marathon in Dayton, Ohio with a group of uh, paralyzed veterans and members, people from, from the Wounded Warrior Project. And I cross the finish line, and this gentleman runs up to me and says, um, are you Dr. Cooper? Are you Dr. Cooper? And I go, yes, I goes, Hey, my son just beat you in the marathon. And I said, oh, that's nice. That's great. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I, stay here. I want to get you something. Well, he, he was an engineer, and he, he had seen the article when it came out. And his son was born with spina bifida. And he bought two copies of the newspaper, had them laminated, and he hung one next to his son's bed. 
and he took one and hung it in his cubicle. And he told me that his son had just graduated from Michigan, University of Michigan, as a mechanical engineer, and that he was an athlete just because of me uh, following my history and my lifestyle. And so it's, it's kind of like Einstein says, um, uh, you're always an example, even if a bad example. So um, it was pretty remarkable. And as a gift, he gave me a laminated copy of the article. So as a, it was probably the best way for me to find out about the article rather than if I had found out when it first came out. Um, so the, uh, this is a quote from the National Organization on Disability. It's one of the advisory committees to the president, presidential point. I always like it because one of the things you know, I'd like to encourage you to do is really engage with, uh, with people with disabilities and older adults in defining your research areas. And not only that, providing opportunities to be members of your research team. Um, you know, hopefully you'll see through my slides and your video, uh, it just through this picture, um, like Brandon and John Duvall, they're, um, John, John is a, uh, oops, sorry, John is a, is a colleague of mine now in our, in her, and a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and Brandon is one of our postdocs, so, um, you know, that's, they, you know, they can be, and they're both engineers, uh, Brandon studied engineering science and became a biomedical engineer, and John said so mechanical engineer, became a biomedical engineer. And I think that's also, that helps make the research real uh, as well. And we need to create more opportunities. It's a lot of lost knowledge if we don't include, be more inclusive. So. I left this internship feeling like well, I had Along done those lines, we also create opportunities for veterans. It's one of our, our veterans. My name is Lauren Duffin. I go to the University of Pittsburgh and I'm a computer engineer. I've heard about Elevate through my academic advisor and I... So I'm going to try to just, I'm going to go back and we don't need to do this whole video about Lauren. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think is also important is we, is finding our veterans and then helping to well, get them into college. So we're great. We have this, a few, if you have uh, students you're aware of that are interested, we have several summer internship programs we run. Our Elevate is for our veteran community, we have a Valor program, which is to introduce people that are interested in um, VA research careers. So we provide 10 week paid internships and then we have a NSF funded research experience for undergraduates that, uh, that can come and spend time with us. But um, you know, the, there's a lot more research needed and, but the power of assistive technology to make the lives of people just in better uh, veterans is pretty well established now. Um, I actually, uh, uh, Layton's probably heard me say this before, but I actually, when I talk to our residents, I tell them it's one of the few things that a resident can prescribe that's pretty much guaranteed to have a positive outcome for their, for their patients. Um, and um, so let me move on. So one of the things I've started working on probably in the last 10 years, it's a little bit outside of my normal domain, is um, trying to understand why there are not as many uh, scientists and engineers with disabilities in our field. And um, part of that largely has to do with three factors. It has to do with uh, accessibility of laboratories, um, field exercises, and computing resources. So basically the accessibility problem. The other problem is the, is a knowledge gap. A lot of teachers and scientists don't know how to make their programs inclusive for individuals with disabilities. And the third problem really has to do with the way that we do science education. When uh, we, in many high schools, or many uh, states, science education is not required after middle school. And a lot of kids with disabilities are redirected into other areas, and they don't have the opportunity then to become scientists and engineers. And I think that leads to a, uh, an, a lack of, op a lack of um, scientists and engineers that we could, that could contribute to American society. So we've been working on that in uh, both the medical space and the engineering space. The nice thing is the National Science Foundation has started to pick up on this and is awarding a number of uh, uh, grants. They have a great program called INCLUDES for underrepresented training underrepresented scientists. 
And uh, that includes people with disabilities in our veterans community. So I'm going to talk now a little bit more about our actual research. We use this um, paid process, participatory action design and engineering, uh, where we look at uh, include user engagement throughout the entire process, beginning with user identification, and then we do storyboarding, which is like how movies are made or graphic novels. We mock up systems. Uh, this is believe these are also a couple of my former students with disabilities, Joe Olson and Ian Rice. Um, we do large scale surveys, and let me talk a little bit about that. So uh, we've uh, we're actually in the process of just completing another survey of over a thousand individuals with disabilities from across the United States, looking at research priorities to set our priorities. Uh, this is a survey we did about three years ago, and the results very interesting. Uh, these are the five priorities that people came up with, and um, it really shows a couple of things. People. Our end users are actually pretty astute, and they're pretty clever at what's, what their needs are and uh, what research priorities could be. One of us interested, they were looking at this. If you look at the center, the one really overarching theme was this participatory design and research, and that included universal design, improving policy, practice, and reducing costs. I'm working things, or at least looking at cost effectiveness, improving education, Knowledge, um, still developing standards and improving reliability, and then knowledge translation. And then there are actually three, there are four technical domains that you can see that people identified as well, and then sort of subcategories within those domains. So that guides our research. That's where we uh, are putting our emphasis and our resources. What's also interesting when we did this study was we found people that identified the need to develop technologies that actually exist and by and large are readily available. And that, what that identified to us, there, there was a knowledge gap. And that how do we disseminate our research? And of course, you know, here at NIH, and those of you listening there various, get funded by federal, various federal agencies and work in them, is that we tend to focus on peer-reviewed publications which is necessary, but that actually means communicating to our peers. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're communicating to the end users, which could be clinicians, or the people using the technology, or the therapeutics, or the, uh, or the therapies that we develop. And so we studied that as well in, 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 a, in this study of over 500 people. We did do uh, a K-cluster analysis we found they kind of fell into three groups. I think the most interesting thing about this is that um, people do rely heavily on clinicians for, as a knowledge source of where they should get new technologies and where they should get new um, treatments. But the other thing that's interesting is that actually more older people are relying on the internet and using the uh, search engines for finding sor sources of information. So we recently just completed a meta-analysis, and the medicine analysis actually found out that the, um, broke down the, the domains that individuals were interested in were community, living in the community, improving leisure and travel, health and well-being, and education and employment. But what's interesting is from that meta-analysis, they also, consumers identified uh, these sort of technical domains or areas where, areas where they wanted to improve technology. So you can see that's transportation and, uh, and automobile driving. Uh, if, you know, if you can't drive, you have a difficult, uh, or don't have good access to public transportation, then you have access to problems with access to health care, access to employment, access to education, access to voting, access to work, uh, worship. Um, autonomous vehicles and wheelchairs, power sources, recreation and leisure, uh, and then uh, patient transfer devices or personal transfer devices getting from one surface to another, and then smart home technology, which includes telehealth, and then, um, and then mobile applications and telecommunications, which I think uh, in some of the meetings we heard this morning, that you know, that kind of relates to the rural health problem as well and getting out uh, access and rehabilitation out into rural communities. So let me kind of go into some of our research domains. So um, 
We uh, are fortunate that we have a, a test laboratory where we can destroy wheelchairs and other types of assistive technology. And we work ex pretty extensively on standards development, both in the United States and globally. I think this is a way to sort of uh, improve, overall improve quality. Um, we work closely with the FDA in this domain. Um, and it does result in some interesting products. But let me just show you one thing that kind of bothers me. So this is, um, this is the, what's called a curb drop test. This is a multi-drum test. So these are the two fatigue life tests that are primarily used in wheelchair standards testing. And um, this vertical line represents what's called the equivalent cycle. So the combination of curb drops and double drums that a chair must pass in order to meet uh, FDA standards. So uh, if you understand Meyer Kaplan survival curve analysis, that all of the, actually all of these should just be straight lines until they get past that line and then start to decay. And what concerns me is that these chairs are on the market. These are already FDA approved and marketed devices. But according to our own standards, these are our own standards used by the FDA, not my own standards, uh, they don't, right? And as a matter of fact, it's only really this, this one uh, ultralight aluminum frame designs that by and large meet comply, by and large comply, and the other ones by and large actually fail. Um, and what's also concerning me as an engineer is that they fail for rather benign reasons or mundane reasons, like heat affected so in a high stress area. That's a, where the weld is not properly done in a high stress area, or holes drilled in high stress areas, or. Um, uh, materials not being annealed. So they're uh, things that we pretty much learn in sophomore, junior level of engineering that we need to really work on. There are some solutions we worked on. This is the uh, uh, oblique angle suspension caster fork. It adds a little suspension element here. Most of the uh, shock and absorb vibration comes through the casters, mainly because you spend most of your time going forward, and those wheels are smaller and they tend to be a little more rigid. So if you add a little bit of compliance there, you can raise or reduce the shock and vibrations exposed to the user and increase the life of the wheelchair. So um, years ago, when I was uh, first getting into this, so I'll, well, actually, when I first worked on the smart wheel as a graduate student, this is the smart wheel here. It's a device that measures the forces and moments applied to the push rooms of a wheelchair. Uh, oddly enough, I didn't really have um, altruistic motivations. I wanted to improve my performance to win a medal in the Paralympics. And so this was a way for me to study. So we used to so develop the first version of the Smart Wheels for wheelchair racing. Uh, oddly enough, we used the same technology improved and advanced to help train our 2020, actually turned out really to be 2021 Paralympic team. Those are. Um, those are Tatiana McFadden's uh, handprints or glove prints on the wheel. We used our team out in Illinois to train them to optimize their propulsion patterns. But it also had the impact of optimizing propulsion patterns for people for daily use. And so this is the, um, let me just see. So this is an ultrasound image of the median nerve uh, looking axial down the nerve. And you can see it's somewhat flattened. So what we did is we had people propel their wheelchairs in a, uh, um, in a fatigue type course, like about 15 minutes of fairly strenuous wheelchair propulsion. And then looked at uh, the median nerve. My colleague, Mike Boninger, uh, did a lot of this work with us. Um, and then we also looked at, this is the bicep tender, to look at rotator cuff injuries. So back in the 1990s and early 2000s, about 80% of manual wheelchair users who um, use the wheelchairs are primarily, is, developed carpal tunnel syndrome or rheumatoid carp injuries within five years. Many of them actually reported that it was as devastating on their life as their original injury. And so um, as a result of that, we did a, the smart wheel helped us first see that happening and relate that to wheelchair propulsion, wheelchair setup. We found a few things. Body weight was an important predictor, so to, to educate people about maintaining a healthy body weight, because uh, it also harms you not only in propulsion, but in transfers. And the other issue was 
but moving the axles forward to take more weight off of the front casters so that you have low, drive more on the lower friction rear wheels. And you could also get a larger portion of the push rims. So you can reduce the force by the amount of work is force times distance, right? So you increase the angle or the distance, you lower the force, puts less strain on the upper extremities. And then lastly, uh, we um, patented and developed two uh, technologies, ergonomic push rooms. I'm using them myself today, actually. I, um, the, um, and what they did is they took a wheelchair propulsion from a pinch grip to a tool grip. And that pinch grip, so that meant it also further reduced the strain on the muscles, right, on the uh, joints, by uh, reducing the amount of gripping force that had to be applied. And, uh, and also the lost energy, basically. Um, and that, um, what's really cool is they came, they're on the market by a company called Tylite. Um, and they, um, oops, sorry. And they, um, they, now we see the rates of carpal tunnel road trail calf injuries because of wheelchair setup, better wheelchair design, and ergonomic push rooms is about 20%. And it probably won't get much lower, uh, too much lower with changes in the wheelchair. Uh, it, because there's other activities such as transfers and other upper, uh, and a lot of use of your upper extremities that you have to do. And so those are things we're working on as well. Those patents have since expired, but what's pretty cool is there are now a number of uh, knockoff or replica products that are on the market, which to me just shows that we were on the right track because uh, once the patents expire of other people come on the market, that shows that you were um, working on something of value. So you, I showed the Meyer Kaplan survivor curve analysis. The other reason it's interesting looking at this at suspension is a road shock and vibration. We've done studies that have shown that wheelchair users experience about the same level of ride shock and vibration as helicopter pilots and long haul truckers. Um, and, and so, as Dr. Gilman knows, that you know, helicopter pilots, they, they are uh, notoriously have back problems and neck problems. Uh, because of a lot of shock and vibration exposure. And it turns out that so do wheelchair users. So Dr. Kuntz on our team has uh, been working at, looking at um, in-wheel sus in suspension systems. Uh, these are three different types. Uh, these are kind of like the spaghetti spoke design. Those are what I'm, I'm using on my chair, actually, uh, which is a soft spoke that allows for some suspension. I, I, uh, and um, then the other ones is actually basically uh, three shock absorbers placed to act as spokes. And the, the other, the, the third design is basically three prosthetic foot blades to be used as shock absorbers. This research is ongoing, but it does show, um, it does indicate by right, when you have rough terrain or curbs, when dropping off of curbs, uh, that it does help reduce a shock and vibration. Um, so you, I talked about the importance of the ergonomics with the smart wheel. It turns out that the, uh, the VA and actually a number of European companies provide, uh, and, so, um, and so does TRICARE actually, will provide hand cycles as a means of exercise for individuals with disabilities, uh, lower extremity disabilities. And, but now, as the number of hand cycle users have grown, carpal tunnel syndrome has come back. Not so much rotator cuff injury is interesting enough because of the pushing pulling motion, you get, it's better for muscle balance. It's, we encourage people to use hand cycling as a means of exercise, but then started to become concerned about the increase in, in carpal tunnel syndrome again. But it turns out we work with uh, several universities in, uh, in, U in, United in uh, Europe, uh, primarily uh, Free University of Amsterdam and uh, also uh, Loughborough University in the UK to look at what's the optimal uh, angle for the grip. Uh, uh, how do you reduce the amount of grip required? That's what this pommel does. Uh, and also, um, how do you improve the grip so you can you can get a better, a less for, less gripping force that's required while hand cycling? So that resulted in this. Uh, uh, what these ergonomic push rooms that also allow width adjustability. And um, we're still doing research on it, but uh, 
the, at least the ergometer studies or stationary hand cycling studies showed that it's a, a pretty effective solution for reducing the, uh, the uh, strains on the, and the hand and wrist. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, transfers is important. This is uh, some of Dr. Kuntz's work. Uh, really kind of cool using co a gaming technology, so the uh, Microsoft Connect technology, uh, to, in order to extend transfer training uh, into the home. And um, she's actually now doing sort of connected training where you can do like peer-to-peer -peer training as well. So like if, you know, if I'm really good at transferring in the car, I can use the, I can share that knowledge with somebody else to help learn how to transfer in the car uh, as well. And so um, it's really nice because it's a really inexpensive system. The software is readily available, and it's uh, really just a simple app that people uh, can can download. And you can do peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing. You can do education, and you can do peer-to-peer uh, cl clinician to. Uh, to clinic, um, to um, customer training as well. Um, so I, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now too. It's another real common problem among individuals with uh, lower extremity paralysis, pressure injuries. And they could be life-threatening, uh, especially in low-income countries where they don't have the uh, same access to care. So we've been, but one of the problems is we do a really great job in the clinic of teaching people the importance of preventing pressure injuries, but we don't do a really good job of teaching them how to prevent pressure injuries. And we can, um, a good friend of mine used to work at NIH, um, David Gray, and the, um, one of the challenges we always face as researchers, when you learn, in, when you work in the lab, you learn what people can do. But what you don't learn is what people do do. And um, that was his can-do, do-do theory, by the way. Um, the, uh, and so the idea is if we can uh, provide sensors under the seat of the wheelchair, um, then we can, um, so that's what we did. Then we can measure what they do do. What type of, pre do they do pressure release? Do they lean forward, do they lean left, do they lean right? Um, do they sort of slouch as a way of pressure relief? We don't encourage people to do push-ups anymore. This is a wheelchair push-up because of the strain on the, el the wrist, elbow, and the shoulders. Um, and it's pretty hard for people to maintain that long enough to actually be an effective pressure relief. And then the idea is to then coach people. So right now we have uh, developed this technology. We've um, tested over 40 people, and we were able to see... Um, determined using uh, machine learning whether they were doing a left lean, a right lean, or a forward lean. Um, it actually turns out it's pretty hard to determine a backward lean, but we could do that by looking not only at center pressure, but the, uh, the total weight on the seat. Which that actually the interesting advantage is you, now your wheelchair also becomes a scale, so you can measure their body weight as well. So people can help maintain body weight. Now the tricky part is to get people to change behavior. The virtual seating coach was developed uh, basically in order to meet the clinical need that we had identified of people getting power wheelchairs with power seat functions, but their uh, condition uh, not, not improving. And so uh, we did a series of experiments to identify that people would use their power seat functions and not necessarily as instructed. The idea with the virtual seating coach was to use the advances in technology, uh, but first onboard computing, uh, later with a, a smartphone technology, to uh, provide that coaching in real time, contextually aware, uh, all the time available to the user, and provide that data to the cloud, one, so those algorithms could be improved uh, based on what was learned, as well as share that data with clinicians in order to improve their clinical practice and eventually improve uh, clinical practice guidelines. And ultimately the goal is that we use the technology interacting with the user to uh, help the user get the maximum benefit from the technology they're using. So the sad thing about that is it wound up on 50,000 people's chairs. It was given out free. 
uh, through the manufacturer, so we worked out with the manufacturer to do this. But we, we misjudged how services are provided. Um, unfortunately, the therapists and the, clinic, the uh, rehab technology suppliers wouldn't set up the, the uh, um, would only set up the, the coach for a small fraction of the people that actually had it, even when it's installed free on their chair. The good news is the people that got it, it reduced their, um, it increased their compliance by fourfold. So are they are here to clinical practice guidelines, which theoretically should reduce their incidence of pressure ulcers of also about fourfold. The bad news is that um, that be, uh, uh, not as many people actually got the system set up for them as we'd hoped to, right? So. Um, we have to, we're taking a new tack now. We're taking the clinician and the supplier out of it and doing education directly to the end user so they can set up the app themselves, which I, I, I'm, I think that is actually going to be more of a trend in, in remote healthcare or telemedicine in the future where we have to educate end users to be active participants in their own care and even maybe active managers of their own care. Partially, I think that's due to the fact that the clinicians just are so pushed for time now, the amount of time they get to spend with individual clients. On the other hand, there are, I think, some people that no matter what the current technology we have and the coaching that we can do is just not going to be sufficient. So we've been working on active cushion technology as well. And um, so this is a project we had with the University of Texas Applied Research Institute. This is a actually an instrumented uh, buttock system we developed for helicopter pilots and wound up using for uh, wheelchair cushion testing as well. Um, so this is an air bladder, oop, go back. This is an air bladder cushion and then um, each one of those cells can be controlled by a valve and pump that remove air into it. Uh, it has internal um, microelectronically machined or MEMS pressure sensors. And then, um, and that's the internal pressure mapper. This is with a sort of the standard off-the-shelf pressure mapping system. They're, as they're notoriously not very accurate, but as I actually think our data is a much better representation and much more accurate. Immense pressure sensors for you engineers in the room. You know, those we all know those are quite accurate and can be used for control. And then um, this is all what we did is we uh, tested. This is just the cushion inflated, ask the per people to sit on it, and that's what their uh, pressure distribution looks like. That's kind of obvious, the ischial tuberosities. Now, standard cushion, passive cushions, what we do is what we call, we would offload the ischial tuberosities, right? So that's, this is an offloading algorithm, right? Detect the ischial tuberosities and offload them. But really what you can do that does is basically transfers the pressure to the surrounding surfaces. Um, we thought there could be a better way. The goal is how do you minimize, pre uh, maximize the, uh, 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 distribute the, pre maximize distribution of the pressure across the entire seating surface while minimizing the pressure on the issue of tuberosity. So that's the, what we call the redistributed algorithm. What you can see here is that now becomes we get rid of all of the red and yellow, the high pressure areas. And then the active part is, is that as you move, it can redistribute, it'll redistribute as you move actively. So it's different than other active cushions, because what other active cushions tend to do is just go through some sort of cycle of, of how they uh, 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 apply pressure in the different segments of the cushion. This is actively looking at your pressure distribution based on your body at anatomic, anatomics and weight distribution and, re and try to redistribute to maximize the pressure over the entire surface, no matter what position you're in. So we're hoping to do a clinical trial fairly soon to get, see how this actually works. Oh, I'm having a hard time getting it. So, um, you know, I told you about my accident, one of the things that, you know, we. Constantly had when my wife Rosie is a physical therapist and a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh as well, um, is that you can get pressure ulcers even if you have a wonderful cushion and you're completely compliant because you're not always sitting in your wheelchair. 
And it turns out that uh, um, it's, a question, it's a great question that clinicians have to ask people because they get pressure ulcers because they sit in their car for a long time without sitting on a cushion. They sat on the floor. We've had people come in and say, oh, I was installing the uh, floorboards in my house. And you know, they spent hours sitting on a hard floor and not realizing that, that they're not protected because you're not in a wheelchair. It's not that it has nothing to do with the wheelchair. It's your body that we're protecting. Um, so we, um, we developed these. Uh, what we call on the move pads. And uh, so it's basically a very simple pad. It was originally developed, I forgot to include a picture, to wrap around a toilet seat. And, um, and then you could travel with it as well. So it fits up in your backpacks so if you go shopping, go, um, go to a state of friend's house, stay in a hotel, you can wrap this around the toilet seat and you have a padded toilet seat wherever you go. Oh, Rosie. Rosie grabbed one. Rosie brought one with her. It's a little show and tell. Um, it's also kind of interesting. So we actually, this technology was so popular, it got licensed really quickly. What's really very interesting is, so once it got out in the wild, what did people do with it? So I used it for like uh, head cycle, head not only toilet seat, but head cycle headrest. Uh, this is the console between the driver's seat and the passenger seat in the car. So if you got in the car on the passenger seat and you need to hop over the driver's seat, you could pad the, you have a pad on the way. Um, or um, if you've, I'm sure you've had clients come in or you've seen this in the clinic, um, where they wrap like a dish towel or a um, um, pot holder around the cushion because they pressure or sores on the elbow. They started using them on armrests. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, a little low cost device, Rosie can pass it around. And it's uh, made to comply to various unusual uh, surfaces, and you can wash it. It's pretty amazing how it turns popular. Um, so, we're also, well, this is largely Dr. DeCiano's work. Uh, so it's hopefully, I'd actually like to encourage you to have uh, ACL. Uh, bring back the uh, the, the uh, regional grants for supportive community organizations. This came out of that. We had one of those ACL grants for Pennsylvania, and we were able to provide support and education to all these regional support organizations for people with disabilities, and um, and then connect them with resources. And so uh, uh, this is this was kind of the app that we developed out of that. And what's nice is we could give them a little bit of money to support their own staff to participate, which is often a problem when you try to change community health, is that nobody has, has time. Uh, so if you could buy a little bit of person's time. Um, and then what really was important that came out of the next slide was um, caregiver, providing caregiver support. So these are you know, family caregivers or non-health care provider caregivers. Um, military calls them non-medical attendants. So they could connect with each other, educate each other, and consumers could share about that, how they could trade. This turned out to be really important in the pandemic when uh, some people, I, matter of fact, people on my staff had to move back home with their parents because they couldn't get assistance. Um, and then also, so they could at least, uh, assistants could kind of coordinate with one another. So they might really be one person's assistant, but they, somebody else came down with COVID, they could kind of help over over at that another person for a while, and they could sort of network and connect with each other. And, um, and then a little bit about well-being and training for them as well, so. You might recognize this project. This was at Fort Belvoir. We uh, worked on the Wounded Warrior Home Project with uh, Clark Realty and um, Michael Graves. Uh, if you don't know Michael Graves, he, he was the architect laureate for the United States for a while. Also had a spinal cord injury, a pretty remarkable guy. Most people know him from developing, he developed a lot of the uh, home and kitchen goods for Target. So there's the Michael Grave line that um, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. It was fun working with him. And we had the opportunity to actually build two homes. Uh, and um, I'll use the German word, maybe a Schrebergarten. That's the 
little garden for uh, people to grow vegetables and things like that. Um, it was really exciting. Uh, the, uh, the DOD gave us the requirement that the, um, they be fully accessible, smart homes, and um, cost no more than traditional military housing and be able to be rented for the same uh, um, BO, uh, BAQ, this basic allowance for quarters. So that's kind of tricky uh, because you have to uh, basically design a home, build it out with materials and technologies that are going to fit within those constraints. But we were able to do that. We were able to build two homes. Um, that's also the fun thing about this, if you know. I was in the Army. There's a little bit of service rivalry here, so there had to be a Marine Corps home. There had to be an Army home. The Army home's a little nicer. Who <laughs> 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 um, um But a uh, um, little bit different designs, uh, but we had, like, multiple points of ingress and egress. One of the fun things was if you held your ID card up to the door, there was an... RFID card reader, uh, you know, as you like with all your PIV cards or CAT cards, there's a little RFID in there. Also invented at the University of Pittsburgh by my colleague Marlon Mickle, who passed away a few years ago. Um, it could then announce who it was because that reader knows who you are because it's your ID. And then you could actually automatically open the door, which actually we were able to use basically home security technology to do that. Um, the way, um, you know, larger hallways. A lot of work, a lot of use of luxury vinyl tile, which walk you can walk on pretty well. You can uh, you can roll on pretty well. It's pretty durable. Um, but the military gave had some fun things. Um, so, for example, in the garage, we had a larger garage with the closet, with the giant, with a storage room in the garage. Um, I knew General Gilman knows why we had that done. So, in the military, you move every few years, and you have to store the boxes for everything. So you could pack them up again in a few years and move them again. So that was one of the things the military said they needed this storeroom. Um, then a wheelchair, we had a, a closet, we built a, a little closet room for like charging the power wheelchair and charging prosthetic limbs, a uh, place for upper extremity amputees, little, uh, in the, there was a, a, an area where they could don and doff their upper extremity prosthetic limbs with one of those trees, uh, which turned out that uh, worked out just as well for, um, Body armor, so you didn't have to, you know, could do the whole pick up from the toward twisting with the body armor. So it's kind of a, a, a interesting thing. Um, a lot of things with natural light, full spectrum lighting. Uh, so it's pretty. Uh, uh, windows where you could crank them up from uh, sitting height. It's actually kind of fun in this study. I'll tell you something that you don't normally hear in the studies or research. So we were doing a lot of work on our own home at the time. So we were the guinea pigs. So I basically, we paid for it ourselves and tried things out. And said, oh, hey, this might work for this home. And then uh, some of that got integrated into the home. So we sort of underwrote the study a little bit while we were remodeling our own house. What's happened with the remote? Um, I mentioned weight is another key thing. So this is our uh, bed scale technology actually funded through an NIH SBIR. Uh, I like this picture because it shows Hurl's capability to build large numbers of units and very high quality for uh, supporting clinical trials, which is largely why we got started with our a large engineering and manufacturing team. Um, and uh, it's also interesting because I think you could actually look at sleep quality, how well people roll over and things like that, how much they get in and out of bed at night as well. Even in the kitchen, where something as simple as preparing meals can be a real challenge. This kitchen is designed for people with Alzheimer's and brain injury. This is the queuing kitchen, where specially designed computer programs provide cues or step-by-step -step instructions for cooking things like pasta. When I click next, the program will give me my first instruction on, on how do I get started with making pasta. Take out cooking pot from the lighted cabinet. Take out pasta from the transparent cabinet. Fill the cooking pot with water from the water faucet. Turn the faucet off. 
Place cooking pot on the stove. Turn on the stove. This program is ideal for someone with cognitive or memory loss problems. But for those who need more help, there's this futuristic device called the Kitchen Bot. The Kitchen Bot can turn a faucet on and off. It can also open cabinets and drawers and operate appliances. It's a sophisticated instrument that moves up, down, and sideways and can be programmed for a specific or a group of functions. And it's and then we also do, um, you can see we have like lighted handles, so we can use them, we can flash them, we can change colors, we can use uh, the, we use the suspended particle glass, so we can turn uh, the glass from milky to clear, so people can see where items are. And then we, we use a connect system as well. We have three connect systems. We know where the person is, if they're idling in space, or they're not supposed to be where they, they're not where, where they are. One of our challenges is we have um, RFID readers and barcode readers, so we can tell you what items to, that you've got, if you've got the right item and the right amount. Some of the challenges we have is like, how do you uh, tell the difference between um, you know, an apple and, a, and an orange? because there's no, no label on it, and, um, or, or you know, different type, red grape and a green grape. You know, those are real, pretty, pretty difficult real world imaging challenges. Um, also working on now caregiver assisted transfers, how best to do caregiver assisted transfers uh, for individuals. And now um, do that as a first, right now we're actually studying the, so, those techniques but we're also working on some technologies to assist. Let me show you some of those. So this is our, our strong arm. Um, that's uh, Mark Greenall, that's uh, he's the Captain Greenall's uh, son. Um, he, uh, and, uh, it's a robotic arm. That the, so this, what's pretty amazing, we were one of the first ones, uh, NSF originally funded this and um, I know one of their concerns was, would we ever get IRB approval to have a robot that can lift 250 pounds, work in close proximity, actually touching a person? So we actually, one of the, we got the first IRB approval for that. Pittsburgh's pretty famous for being a little, letting you take some risks with the, or IRB letting people take some risks, obviously calculated risks. Um, but it mounts to the person's wheelchair, it can go on the, it can ride on that track and go to the left side or the right side. It could park in the back and be out of the way and not increase the footprint of the wheelchair to lift 250 pounds. So the caregiver doesn't have to do any lifting now. The robot does the lifting and move from one surface to another. You still have to get the sling underneath the person and working on maybe uh, incorporating the, the, the cushion and the backrest into the sling somehow so you could uh, do that as well. Um, but. This is what we've got several uh, projects we're working on now that I'm even a little bit more excited about. We took a hospital bed and modified it to be a robotic bed. And we took a power wheelchair and modified it so the two of them to talk together to do no lift transfers. So you can see, this is actually one of our graduate students who uses a power wheelchair, uh, Jessica, with one of our engineers, Josh Brown. And so the wheelchair kind of works in concert with the chair, with the bed, to pour the person into bed. So the backrest got out of the way, and the backrest, of the bed acts as the backrest of the chair during the transfer. Um, he doesn't have to list her feet, but uh, in order not to, so we you know, protect people's heels during the transfer, even though that's a Teflon coated surface. Um, people more, and he's doing it all basically with that tablet. Right now we have that tablet hardwired uh, instead of, we can do it with a phone and we can do it with a wireless connection. The problem is if you have, we don't want that connection to be broken ideally. Um, it also gives, if it's tethered, it gives it the fact that you know where it's gonna be uh, rather than it walking away. And then um, you can see there's a conveyor, we put a conveyor on the belt and that conveyor, but it has another couple of advantages the person can reposition themselves in bed. So that they sit up and they kind of crunch down at the end of the bed, they can use that to stretch back out again. 
and it has all the bed functions. So you can still raise and lower the bed. You can raise the feet. You can raise the head. Uh, and so you can we maintain all of those functions. We uh, we also um, are measuring the current in the actuator, so we can actually get a really pretty decent estimate of the person's body weight as well. And so that allows us to look if people are moving up and down. And we have uh, because we're we have this we're we're, we're controlling the transfers. And we were, we did some studies in long-term care facilities where the, you're mandated to get people in and out of bed so many times per day. We would know that. We knew exactly how many times people got in and out of bed. The nice thing is it's also faster, and you can see it, it only takes one person. You don't have to go get a, you know, a, a, an overhead lift or something like that. And it has a 600-pound capacity. Um, I mentioned transportation is one of the priorities, so uh, we... Um, been doing some work with the Department of Transportation. This is our, uh, uh, just we did a uh, survey uh, about the uh, need for self-driving vehicles and improving in vehicles. Um, you can see what, um, what ch some of the challenges, that what happens is when people get a mobility impairment that affects transportation, they stop driving, right? They don't, they reduce their uh, activity. And then the second most common, and the most common solution is to ask other people for a ride. You know, that presents significant challenges, especially in rural and suburban environments where public transportation is not readily available. Um, there are some new tech. What's really great is there are some mainstream technologies that are all available now and others that are coming out that can improve uh, transportation and are making it possible for people with disabilities to drive or drive longer and for older adults to drive longer and drive safer. And... Uh, um, I just also point out we're we're working on new universal docking systems, and we're also working on uh, as new electric vehicles come out. They have batteries in the chassis, and so you can't really drop the floor like is currently done. So we're looking at new designs. How would we modify those vehicles and modify wheelchairs that, so that these uh, vehicles will be accessible and available for use in the future? Uh, I think I can. Uh, other fun thing is we found out is, so how do we educate people about how to do this? So we're actually working with our friends across the street and at Catholic University of America here on developing an educational board game uh, to teach uh, uh, primarily occupational therapists uh, and transportation engineers and maybe um, city planners on how to develop transportation systems so that they... Um, so to learn about the barriers faced by people who spit and older adults in transportation. I think I'll skip this one. <laughs> uh, My research project is focused on the performance evaluation and the user interface of the assistive robotic manipulators. So the assisted robotic arms is that a robotic arm can be mounted on the wheelchairs and uh, that can assist a, uh, wheelchair users or people with the disability to do uh, some daily tasks uh, using the control interface. So, so the reason we developed the interface is that uh, we have tests with the current uh, robotic original interfaces and uh, a lot of user have difficulty learning those uh, either take some memorize the keys or memorize the command or combination of uh, different keystrokes so the interface we de develop kind of a reduce those uh, frustration so they can quickly learn how to use, control the robot and they can do the task button just uh, within 10 minutes. There was one veteran look at our robot and he's so, so exci he was so excited and he, he said, he just point to the robot and, and saying to the, the caregiver, that's what I want. So, so we're also working on robots for um, allowing people to work in the workplace. This is a robot that actually can strafe back and forth, go up and down, swivel. Uh, allow people to work in fulfillment centers. So um, it's pretty exciting. 
we dealt these, did a study, and now there's over 500 of them in use across the United States in various fulfillment centers. So when you order a package online, you might be uh, using our technology. I'm going to go through. This is our, uh, just go to our Bot. That's our stair climbing wheelchair that can climb um, eight inches. This is Dr. Kim, one of our graduate students, um, one of my former graduate students, now professor at Yonsei University. Can climb an eight inch curb. Uh, go at high level, um, and also, if I show you in the next slide, since I'm running out of time, um, it also go down. Um, I wonder if I can. So a common problem of tips and falls of wheelchair users is they're going down the side. They're going down the sidewalk. Somebody walks in front of them. They get two wheels up on the curb, and they get two wheels on the street, and they tip over, and they go to the hospital. And, um, or they go over uneven terrain. So we've been working on that same chair that can climb curbs. We can use that same feature to, uh, to self-level. And if you look at the lower pictures, you can see if you're, again, Jessica riding over uneven terrain, uneven sidewalks, and being able to maintain uh, position. And we can do up about eight inches in different tonight. And, um, this is a little bit older version. We have a newer version that uses electrohydraulic actuators. And we could do four aft as well, um, which is, uh, and people said it's like riding on a ma magic carpet. We're li working on alternative power sources. Uh, we talked a little bit at lunch today about uh, um, supercapacitors and other types of batteries. Uh, one of our probably more exciting ones here. Being in a power wheelchair makes it even more difficult. These wheelchairs run on electricity, and when water comes in contact with them, the results can be shocking. So how do you build a water park that all kids can enjoy? That's the question Gordon Hartman had. He runs the world's first accessible theme park, Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio. We had to come up with a wheelchair that would uh, allow for it to get wet and still be able to move about. Uh, through the use of someone's um, ability to uh, use a joystick. That's when he discovered the work of Dr. Rory Cooper at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Cooper is world-renowned for numerous past witness this independence will be influenced too. That's the kind of experiences you want kids to have so that sure. when they grow up they don't have those by wheelchair industry. Brandon Daveler a current graduate student at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences is a researcher studying under Rory Cooper. Their team works out of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories where they modeled and built the new chair. The chair that makes a challenging trip to the water park, well, fun. I like to have the freedom to run around. It was rewarding to see just how he lit up and the enjoyment that he got out of going through the sprinklers and the water. He wants to be independent. Quite frankly, we let him go for 30 minutes by himself. And that's what he wants. And so I'll, I'm just going to move on to the, uh, to the end and say thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Well. Anyone here is free to use the, the microphones. There's several questions online. I'm going to try to uh, combine them. There's some, several themes. Uh, one theme is uh, you have a plethora of, uh, use, of useful ideas. Can you speak a little about how your lab works? How are these ideas generated? How are the projects originated and tested? I think we, you gave a hint about that. They're not all originating from you, I think. You get people asking you to do something. Right. So we, our ideas are actually generated by end users and clinicians. Mm -hmm. And um, we do that by surveying them and doing focus groups. We, we also will take you know, unsolicited ideas. Uh, and then, of course, the clinicians see right. challenges that people face. We use a, um, I call it the area under the impact curve kind of method for selecting which projects we uh, will focus on working on. What I mean by that is, if there's a large, a small number of people that are going to have a large impact on their life, uh, then that you know that area can be fairly large. Or a smaller, a large number of people that the impact might not be as great, that area under the curve will be large. Those are the types of projects we would look at. Um, questions about your your lab and your personnel, your staff. 
can you discuss the, the size of your lab? Uh, how do you actively recruit students with disabilities or do they find you? Um, we at the NRH are eager to, eager to approve the diversity of our staff. What tips can you tell us about how to recruit and retain staff with disabilities? That's a great question. Uh, so um, there are about 70 people in our lab and we're about uh, 28,000 square feet and looking to grow to 35,000 square feet. Um, and um, we started recruiting people with disabilities 30 years ago. Uh, I guess uh, there was, what, there's a country song, I was country before country was yeah. really cool. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, uh, and the, you know, the, there's two things. You know, so we actively recruit. We uh, go to events like, well, we actually have an entire team responsible for that, run by Rosie, our stakeholder engagement team, which includes uh, both people with disabilities and veterans. And they, we go to, we get engaged in the community. So we participate in events by organizations to support people with disabilities, organizations of people with disabilities. We go to national meetings where they are. Um, and then we, um, I, like we provide high school internships, undergraduate internships, college internships, um, stipends for graduate students, and postdocs and early faculty. And, um, so uh, I would say it's gotten easier over time because people know that we're a lab, you know, we're a friendly place for them to work. Um, the other thing that we've done is our facilities are accessible. So we have larger hallways, mm. full spectrum lighting. We uh, provide a common, you know, we go beyond accommodations. We don't look at what ADA is standards are. We look at what do people need to be uh, productive uh, teammates. Yeah, so. that, that's related to this other question, uh, such wonderful work. A few months ago, the New York Times read an article about how many doctor's offices are not accessible and that many doctors don't want to deal with the expense of better accessibility. Are you working with the healthcare facilities in this regard? We are to some extent, like the, the bed I showed. You're right, I, that's I think what generated that was question. That was a good, is a good example where we could help healthcare facilities, which is a win-win for them because they, um, it not only reduces the amount of staff needed to go from one place to another to help with transfers, reduces the, it could, should reduce um, workers' compensation costs to injuries to staff from having to perform awkward transfers. Um, so, and then a lot of that telehealth technology is a way to extend the work of clinicians. So instead of you know, a person coming to the doctor's office, as I mentioned, transportation is a huge barrier for large numbers of people, that you can bring the healthcare to the person and maybe doing it in, um, more effectively in their home setting. So you, know, you do, if we, I think the trend in the future is gonna be more outpatient care in the home setting, in the home and community setting. And then we're gonna have to develop technologies where we can assess the progress and also provide training, ongoing training in home community settings. Um, so the other things that uh, I, I guess is important to mention is that you know we are engineers, PTs, OTs, counselors, physicians, some data scientists, um, even a couple lawyers, all working together. Mm -hmm. our, our lawyers are patent lawyers, but um, so that that uh, to transfer our knowledge into the clinical setting. And vice versa, right? So when we develop into the clinical setting, what their barriers that they see in the clinical setting transfer it to us. Um, and um, for, but unfortunately, we had a, we've had pretty good influence on our UPMC health system, which is our university affiliated healthcare system, with um, you know adult changing tables and high low tables, um, adding uh, uh, you know a, a family bathrooms, which actually benefit a lot larger population than you might think. Um, actually, uh, you know, I, I know we haven't actually systematically studied, but anecdotally, it's, uh, it's almost everybody actually prefers those facilities mm -hmm. uh, than, uh, than the ones that are typically provided. And uh, there's some really cool things in Europe, like I showed you the robotic arm. Those are covered by the VA, and they're covered by most German insurance companies now, mm. which is really cool. But also, Europe has passed a law that, for example, uh, bathrooms have to have real walls and real stalls between doors and that um, uh, and then they have to you know and they that and through that 
they can um, have an accessible bathroom within a regular bathroom. And then, they, of course, they have family bathrooms as well, which, which benefit people with children and other people that have that need assistance, not just people with disabilities. So lots about universal design and trying to convince the uh, work with the healthcare system. We're very fortunate our healthcare system is, is, uh, has, uh, has recognized the benefit, uh, as also um, to, their, to their employee workforce and to the, uh, the people they provide care to. Yeah, on that, let me close with, uh, it was more of a comment, and it came in early, but it, it kind of doubles down on what you just said. Um, just sharing my thoughts, I, I feel that there are no clear boundaries between having a disability or not. And then she goes on to explain a few things. But so I think your research can benefit anyone, regardless of the presence or absence of a disability, at any given moment. Like the things you're describing, people prefer <laughs> some of these uh, conveniences that you've created. Exactly right. So I'm out of the philosophy that everybody develops a disability at some point mm -hmm. in their life. Right. And maybe only the last few seconds of life. Uh, and so maybe for a birth. But we're all going to have a disability. And so. Uh, and what really, if you think about this more as a universal design approach, mm -hmm. and how do we just make the world a better place for everyone? Yeah, so um, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for uh, the talk. And um, yeah, I think if anyone has any other comments, we have a few minutes here to just chat uh, in Lipset as well. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's wonderful to be back and be here in person.